Fulfill Radio, a voice you can trust. Broadcasting Live presents Two Guys and a Bible with Don Preston and William Bell. Join us each week at 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Central as we bring you exciting, sound, challenging, and comforting messages regarding the end times. Thank you for tuning in today. Don Preston is the founder of Preterist Research Institute, or PRI. Don is a prolific author, having written and published 19 books, a host of audio and DVD studies, and is a debater and defender of the full preterist view. His websites are BibleProphecy.com, Eschatology.org, and DonKPreston.com. William Bell is the founder of AllThingsFulfilled.com Ministries and has a website bearing the same name, and has authored three books, audios and DVDs. He has published hundreds of articles and recordings. And now, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Two Guys in a Bible broadcast with Don Preston and William Bell. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is William Bell, and I'm doing a little test here to see how the volume is uh, checking out. Don, what are you getting on your end? Yeah, you're nice and clear at this time, William. Okay, very good, very good. Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen. We're delighted to be back with you on Two Guys in the Bible, right here on Phil Radio, the voice you can trust. I'm William Bell, and of course, you heard the voice of Dr. Don Preston. And we're both just getting back in town from Ludington, Michigan, where we attended the Spirit and Life Seminar Conference with Steve Basin and Dr. Neubauer and several other teachers from around the country. We had a wonderful time and great uh, lecture fellowship. Uh, just as we do at, you know, all the conferences that we attend, and uh, we're excited, of course, to be back on the Hawaii and, you know, in the company of each of our own. So, I know that uh, everybody's... Uh, William, you are breaking up now. Okay. All right. I'm going to stop it's speaking. Not, but it's it's not static. You're breaking in and out. All right. Go ahead. Say what? Go ahead. You can take it from here. Okay. <laughs> One more of these uh, wonderful technical issues, folks. I don't. We don't know what in the world it is. I know. I know. A lot of the times, it's almost beyond our control. Uh, we don't change our settings, or uh, we don't even change our technology. But from time to time, when we get on, uh, we we have these issues, and. Uh, you know, we, we've been offered some help by different individuals. Hopefully one of these days we can take advantage of those. But uh, as William was saying, we both got back from uh, Ludington, Michigan, which is, oh, about an hour and a half uh, away from Grand Rapids. Uh, it was my very first time ever to Ludington, and boy, oh, boy, is it ever beautiful up there. Now, I will tell you this, that while we were there, it was about, oh, it might possibly have gotten up to 85 degrees, and the people were just going, oh, my goodness, it's hot. Oh, my goodness, it's hot. And, of course, here in Ardmore, uh, we've already had some days of a heat index of 109, and it was up close to 105. Uh, plus, today, uh, I had to walk out to my shop just a little while ago uh, to check on uh to check on some stuff, make sure it was okay uh, after being gone. And I wasn't out there 10 minutes, and I'm sweating like crazy. I mean, it's just crazy. Uh, So it's very, very hot here. And the difference between their 83, 85, and our 105, let me tell you what, folks. I told some of them, I said, you don't even know what hot is. However, on the other hand of that, I said, I'll take my 105, even 108 heat index any day over being in Michigan in January, February, March, wherever, you know, during that period of time in which the snow is up to my eyeballs. Uh, I do not want any part of that. I'm not a cold weather person. I don't like ice and snow. So 105 is just fine with me. So anyway, but it was nonetheless extremely beautiful up there. We had a very, very enjoyable uh, seminar, heard some great lessons. And, um, you know, William and I both were extremely impressed with Kyle Elliott. He had 
he had a discussion. You wouldn't really call it a debate with our very good friend Michael Miano on uh, the doctrine of, well, we could call it total hereditary depravity uh, or the ori- or original sin, whichever term you, you would prefer. But uh, I tell you, Kyle's presentations were just uh, absolutely dynamite. Uh, his use of logic is impeccable. Uh, it is stunningly clear. And... Uh, our, our friend Michael uh, took a very low key approach. He did not, he did not ask for, did not examine, did not re, uh, even attempt to refute even one of the syllogistic arguments that were offered. Uh, and so, uh, William and I both just felt like Kyle Elliott did a fantastic job. Uh, we felt like Daniel, Daniel Rogers. Daniel Rogers took an approach. Now I didn't get to hear all of it because I was preoccupied at the time I got called out, but I got to come in on the tail end of it, and Daniel's approach was to show how the atonement should affect our everyday lives, how it should transform our everyday lives. You know, he he did not do what might be called an exegetical investigation of the atonement uh, to prove, for instance, that Christ had to come, come again to complete the atonement. That was not his approach. His approach was, what is the practical application? How does Christ's sacrifice impact our lives on a personal level, on a family level, on a societal level? So it was very, very good. I I, I just really like that. And uh, uh, go ahead. I thought it was uh, it, more humbleetic, you might say. Yes, indeed. It was more homiletic than it was exegetical. And, uh, you know, that's certainly got its place. That's got its function. And uh, I just felt like it was fantastic. And and I got to tell you, folks, uh, William almost had too much fun. (laughs) And uh, (laughs) uh, he just almost had too much fun in his presentation. Uh, There was another debate uh, there at the conference, and it was between – Olger Neubauer, and Bill Lockwood. Now, I debated Bill Lockwood back in 91, 2, and 3. And I had three po- formal public debates with him. And I have to tell you, Bill was a totally different man then from what he is now. He's very kind, very gracious, and I would even go so far as to say that in many ways, an humble man now. Uh, it, is, it is remarkable, and it's refreshing. I've, I thoroughly enjoyed being around him. Uh, up there this past weekend, and I mean that very sincerely. <clears throat> Pardon me. But uh, in in my debates with Bill in 91, 2, and 3, he put up a chart about the funnel, what he called the funnel, the 8070 funnel. And he the said, well, we as preterists, the, the, I'm sorry, yes, the apocalyptic funnel. And uh, he said, we as preterists just pour everything into that funnel and down in the bottom of it, he has a pot with a skull and crossbones on it, meaning, of course, his application of that is that uh, preterism leads to death. Well, he uh, he put some passages at the bottom, Acts 17, 30, and 31, Acts 1, 9 to 11, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, which are the passages which supposedly – Ah, yes, indeed, Second Peter 3 – which supposedly refute the idea of the apocalyptic funnel. Well, uh, not only did he use that debate in my debate with him, but uh, Stephen Wiggins, whom William debated in Memphis some years ago, he likewise used, he either used the same funnel or, or chart, or he used one very, very similar to it. Uh, the one he had there at Ludington had been upgraded in full color, a uh, very, very impressive chart. And uh, w- William got up and he said, folks, I got to tell you, I got a love-hate relationship with this chart. He said, uh, I hate it because it's wrong. I love it because it's give me a, going to give me an opportunity to work on it. And boy, did he ever work on it. <laughs> uh, it was absolutely hilarious and powerful. For William to go through that chart and demonstrate 
Well, one of the charts that William used was the parallels between Matthew 24 uh, and 1 Corinthians 15. And uh, by the way, William, when I got home, I started going through my charts because I thought, you know what? I think I've done something similar to that. And sure enough, I had. Uh, I've forgotten the date on mine, but it, it's a chart, parallel chart, very, very similar to yours. I don't. I think you had more points on it than I had in my chart, but nonetheless, it's very, very similar uh, to the chart that you put up. But the point of it is, folks, William showed that the parallels from Matthew 24 are, by and large, from the section of Matthew 24 that Bill Lockwood agrees applied to AD 70. And those very constituent elements are used by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. The point being, obviously, that Paul draws from the Olivet Discourse, from the section that Jesus spoke about the impending fall of Jerusalem and the end of the Old Covenant Age. Therefore, since what Paul had to say in 1 Corinthians 15 about the coming resurrection was based on and taken from the Olivet Discourse, and since the section that he drew from is the section that Bill Lockwood agrees applied to the Lord's coming in AD 70, that must mean that 1 Corinthians 15 applied to that time as well. And, you know, as uh, as we often say as preachers, uh, we, ha we have an expression that we use sometimes when we talk about a minister just really, really going to town on a passage and doing a great job of exegesis. We say he really waxed an ele elephant. And that's, you know, obviously a distortion of the term he waxed eloquent, and William Bell really, really waxed an elephant uh, with with that apocalyptic chart of Bill Lockwood. It was it, it was it was downright funny in many ways, but it was also extremely, extremely powerful and effective in the way that he presented the fallacies, the fallacies in exegesis, the fallacy of hermeneutic and the fallacies of logic that were in Bill Lockwood's presentation. So it was, <laughs> it was, it was quite impressive. Well, thanks, Don. Well, Don did an awesome lesson as well and uh, showed the connections between uh, Isaiah 40 and Isaiah 62. And eventually the first John Baptist as the one who prepared the way for Christ. And just through, yeah, you know, you're breaking up badly again. On that. I mean, I thought it was such an impressive, well thought of all the presentation talks, so that, you know, already knows what to expect in the rest of it. But that one was absolutely profound. It was just amazing. And I told you that I got a copy of that lesson, so if I want to go back and study it, some of the things, make sure I get that down. The, the, William, I, William, I can here. barely, barely understand you. Can, hear, can you hear me? Yeah, you're you're breaking up very very badly. Yeah, I can't I can't understand you, William. You, you've got some you got some real serious uh, audio problems there. I, I don't know what you need to do. Yeah, yeah, I basically lost you. I'm I'm catching up. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> And uh, I, I don't know. I don't know if anyone else is hearing that or not. I don't know if it's breaking up with anyone else or not. But um, but with me from uh, from from this end, uh, I, uh, I I can't understand a word you're saying literally. So uh, that's unfortunate. So we'll uh, we'll see if William can get his uh, mic problem worked out and uh, and get back on with us here momentarily. In the meantime. Uh, you know, I, I want everyone to know that you can actually go online uh, on the website as uh, on Facebook, uh, and as it is written, that's the Facebook page, and all of the speeches that were given up there. I mean, you had men like Brent Bischel from Indianapolis. You had, uh, uh, again, I've already mentioned, I've already mentioned Daniel Rogers. Uh, thank you, Rod. Uh, William Rod Rupert says you're, you are indeed breaking up uh, as he's trying to listen to you. So it's not just me receiving you. Uh, you're actually breaking up for those who are trying to listen as well. So uh, 
a- anyway, uh, we we had some really really good men there uh, that were that just did an outstanding job, and we appreciate their dedication. I mean, they came from California, uh, you know, they came from here, they came from there, and there were a lot of people there. We had people there from Canada, folks, and of course. Uh, Michigan is not all that terribly far, <laughs> you know, geographically from uh, from Canada. But nonetheless, it shows you the interest that was there. And the congregation there at Ludington is to be commended and complimented for their dedication to the truth, uh, for standing by uh, Brother Steve uh, Basin, and, and, as well as Holger Neubauer. He has a congregation up there as well. And, <clears throat> pardon me. Through all of the peer pressure, through all of the ostracism, uh, those congregations have stood strong, and they support both Holger and Steve in, a, in an excellent way, and it's just good to see. I mean, it's just good to see that there are, there are churches around, there are groups of people around who are willing to rethink, they're willing to restudy, and they're willing to change their minds if and when they're convinced of the Scripture. So, like like I said, uh, it, it was a <coughs> <coughs> it was a good lectureship. It was an honor to be there. had a had a really great time. And of course, I got up there on Wednesday. I wasn't supposed to speak until Saturday. And I've got to tell you, uh, my voice is still weak from being there. And uh, I, I told the guys a- after a couple of days, I said, "Look, guys." I've got to find a way to shut up. I've got to find a way to stop laughing so much because, you know, you, I, I got to tell you, you get a bunch of pre, <clears throat> you get a bunch of preachers together, and it can just be hilarious uh, because we like to tell stories of the crazy things that have happened to us in our ministry, and I want to tell you, there strange things happen to preachers, hilarious things have ha- happened to preachers uh, in their congregational settings that uh, when you get around and you listen to them and you tell the stories and it, I mean you just laugh hilariously and so like I said I, I had to tell them I said look guys I, I've just got to find a way to stop laughing so much to stop talking so much or I'm not going to have a voice to even talk well thankfully I did have a voice I was able to finish my lesson uh, and what have you but now my voice is very weak uh, as you can already tell and uh so it needs to rest just just a little bit, but uh, I don't know how that's going to happen. But in the meantime, you know, folks, we, we've been talking to you about the Messianic temple, uh, the Messianic temple that is promised in the Old Testament. And we have suggested to you that, that in the Old Testament, let, let me see if I can find the best way to express this. That in, in the Old Testament, you have this prediction not only not only of the temple, but you have some Old Testament references that if a person if a person looks at those passages and examines them carefully, number one, they they let us know that. There will be, in fact, there would be, in fact, a Messianic temple. Number two, their descriptions of that Messianic temple. Now, they may not even use the word temple. They may use that word house. But in, in the Hebraic vernacular, the house of the Lord is, without any doubt at all, the temple. And so they use this terminology, but what I started to say was, when, when we find these descriptions of what the temple in the kingdom, the Messianic temple would be, those passages, those descriptions are absolutely revolutionary. And they are stunning. I mean, try to put yourself into a Hebraic mindset that said and that thought, the following, okay? This will be very brief. Number one, the temple is restricted to Jerusalem. 
worship of the Lord is restricted to the temple. Number three, sacrifices are restricted to the temple. Number four, the offering of sacrifices can only be made by the Levites of the Aaronic tribe. No man could offer a sacrifice at the temple on the altar that was not a Levite. No foreigner, in other words. And I, don't, I mean, this means that no, no one of the other 11 tribes could offer a sacrifice on the, at the temple and on the altar. Not needless to say, therefore, no foreigner who is not of the children of Israel could ever offer a sacrifice on the altar. And so with, with, uh, with a little bit of that in the background, I want to read to you a little bit from Isaiah chapter 60. All right? I'm just going to read this. <clears throat> Pardon me. Now, Isaiah 62, by the way, is very, very similar to Isaiah chapter 60. You can take your own time to read Isaiah chapter 62. It is an extremely important messianic prophecy. And I think I heard William mention in my lesson at Ludington, Michigan, over this last weekend, I did an exegetical study of the parousia of Christ as foretold in Matthew 16, 27, and 28, understood through the prism of Isaiah 40, Isaiah 62, Malachi chapter 3, and Malachi chapter 4. And so what we have in these texts is the prediction of the coming of the Lord, the prediction of the time that the Gentiles would be called to the Lord. You have the predictions of the coming of the Lord in judgment, the coming of the Lord in salvation, the coming of the Lord in the kingdom. Well, Isaiah chapter 60 gives us a slightly different nuance. It gives a lot of those constituent elements, but it gives us a little bit of a different nuance, and that nuance has to do with the temple. Okay? So again, I'm going to begin reading Isaiah chapter 60, and I'm going to go all the way down a good bit into the chapter. Arise, shine, for your light is coming, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. Now Isaiah 40, okay, this is a direct echo of Isaiah chapter 40, and the glory of the Lord being seen. Okay, verse 3, the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. That's Isaiah chapter 62, okay? Verse 4, lift up your eyes round about and see, all they gather themselves together, they come to thee. Thy sons shall come from afar, thy daughters shall be nursed at your side. Then thou shalt see and flow together together. Your heart shall fear and be enlarged, because the, the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto thee. Now, here's an example, by the way, of Hebrew, number one of Hebrew parallelism, when it says the abundance of the sea shall be converted to thee. Now, watch. The forces of the Gentiles shall come to thee. Now, again, this is a Hebrew parallelism. The Jews, the Hebrews, often referred to the sea or excuse me, referred to the Gentile world as the sea. And you see that in the parallelism. The abundance of the sea shall be converted. Well, how do you convert fish? Okay? It's not talking about converting fish and whale and porpoises and what have you. It's the conversion of the Gentiles. All right. The forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. So here's a prediction of the restoration of Israel, and as a result of the restoration of Israel, now keep in mind, folks, as William and I have discussed uh, on previous programs, 
the conversion of Israel automatically includes the Messianic temple. Okay? So even though the word temple may not be used, the word temple permeates the text because it's about the restoration of Israel. We will see that even more momentarily. Okay. Verse 6. The multitude of camels shall cover thee, the dromedaries of Midian and Ephah, and all they from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and incense. They shall show forth the praises of the Lord. Now, look, folks, these are pagan regions. These are not Israelites. So this is building on the fact of the conversion of the Gentiles. Now, watch. All the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered together unto you, the rams of Nebaioth shall minister unto thee. They shall come up. Now watch this. They shall come up with acceptance on my altar, and I will glorify the house of my glory. Say what? Who are these people? The flocks of Kedar shall be gathered together. The rams of Nebaioth shall minister unto thee. They shall come up with acceptance on my altar. Now, I'm reading from the King James. The New King James talks about these individuals, these people from Kedar, Nebaioth, and these other regions. And it says, they shall ascend my altar, my altar and their sign. Sacrifices will be accepted. Oh, wait a minute. Holy cow. Can you imagine being a Hebrew and reading that one day at the coming of the Lord, when the Lord would be glorified, foreigners, not of the 12 tribes, not only not of the 12 tribes, not even of Levi. And they wind the altar of the Lord and offer acceptable sacrifice. Now, I want to tell you something. In the dispensational paradigm of the Messianic temple, which they build their concept of the Messianic temple, the millennial temple, as they call it, on Ezekiel 43 through 48. Well, ladies and gentlemen, their construct of the dispensational, you know, millennial temple does not allow foreigners to offer sacrifice on the altar at the Jerusalem temple. Period. End of story. And yet here is the prediction of the house of the Lord. And let's continue a little bit. Verse 9. Surely the isles, that's the islands. Now, folks, let, let's be very, very clear. The islands were non-Israelite. Israel was never given any islands as their land of possession. None. So when it talks about the isles shall wait for me, Yahweh is saying the, the islands shall wait for me. And, and that terminology is that they shall wait to serve me. They're waiting for my blessings. Surely the isles shall wait for me, the ships of Tarshish first. Now watch this, to bring your sons from afar their silver and their gold with them unto the name of the Lord thy God, to the Holy One of Israel, because he has glorified thee. Now watch. And the sons of strangers shall build up your walls. Their kings shall minister to you. For in my wrath I smote you, but in my favor have I had mercy on thee. Therefore, your gates, this is the new Jerusalem, shall be open continually. Now, if you don't recognize Revelation 21, 25, and following this, you're not paying attention. <laughs> I'll say that kindly. 
they shall not be shut day or night, that men may bring unto thee the forces of the Gentiles, that their kings may be brought. Well, once again, here's the conversion of Israel. Here's the restoration of Israel. But in, in, in addition to the restoration of Israel, the Gentiles would be brought into this city. Now watch. For the nation and the kingdom that will not serve thee shall perish. That's Zechariah 14, by the way. Yea, those nations shall be utterly wasted. The glory of Lebanon shall come unto you, the fir tree, the pine tree, the box together, to beautify, watch this, the place of my sanctuary. And I will make the place of my feet glorious. Now, we can, we can, we will stop right there. The point of fact is, you can see here how God is predicting the messianic kingdom. It's the, it's the house of the Lord. And did you notice, foreigners will build up the place of my sanctuary. Foreigners will build up your walls. That's Israel's walls. This is foreigners versus Israel, but it's foreigners glorifying God through Israel. And for the nation and the kingdom, that's not just Israel. For the nation and the kingdom that will not serve serve you, and that could probably be taken as serving Yahweh, but I won't belabor the point, shall perish. Those nations shall be utterly wasted. Now, once again, ladies and gentlemen, it, we really, really, really have to catch the power of what's being stated here. Keep in mind that when Ezra and Nehemiah returned from Babylonian captivity. The pagans, the foreigners of the land, wanted to help reconstruct the temple. They wanted to help rebuild temple. What did Nehemiah do? He absolutely forbade them from doing it. He said it's not allowable. Pagans, foreigners, those not of the house of Israel, we're not allowed to build the house. But here, oh my goodness, something radically, revolutionarily different, <clears throat> pardon me, is under consideration. Foreigners or strangers will build up your walls. They will build my house. You know, I'm reminded of how Paul, in Ephesians chapter 2, 15 and following, actually verse 12 and following, writing to the Gentiles said, You therefore are no longer strangers and foreigners. That's verse 19. But it, he said, At one time, you were called the uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision in the flesh. But, but, you are no longer strangers and foreigners. Now, he said, you who sometime were far off are made nigh through the blood of Christ. He has broken down. God has broken down the middle wall of partition containing commandments that was against us. And he has made of two one new man. So making peace. Did you catch that here in Isaiah chapter 60? The foreigners would come into Israel. That's peace. That's the, that's the barrier between Jew and Gentile being broken down. Isaiah chapter 60 is a marvelous commentary on Ephesians chapter 2 and the creation of a new nation, a one new man, a corporate body of the church of the living God. And so here in Isaiah chapter 60, where it says, foreigners shall build up your walls, foreigners shall build the house of my sanctuary, along with Israel, you see. Ephesians chapter 2, 19, you therefore are no longer strangers or foreigners, the very term that he uses back here in Isaiah chapter 60, 
but fellow citizens of the saints and of the household of God, you are being built up a habitation of God through the Spirit. What's the habitation of God? It's the temple of God. As Paul would write, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, you, writing to the church at Corinth, made up of Jews and Gentiles, and he says, you are the temple of God. Let me say again, folks, this is incredible stuff. This is revolutionary stuff, and it makes you wonder how the ancient Hebrew, Hebrews would have clear would have understood this it makes you wonder if they pondered over this like they did Isaiah chapter 53 he was wounded for our transgressions by his stripes we are healed he was led as a sheep to the slaughter yet he opened not his mouth and as we know from Acts chapter 8 and the words of the Ethiopian eunuch when Philip asked him do you understand what you're reading and the man said how can I except some man should guide me and you can read the literature, the ancient literature, and know that the Jews had no clue whatsoever who and what Isaiah 53 was talking about. So did they really know what Isaiah 60 was talking about? In foreigners building up the walls of Jerusalem, did they really fully understand that foreigners would build the temple. You know, so far as I'm aware, folks, no foreigners were allowed to help build. Number one, I know they were not allowed in the time of Nehemiah. But I've often wondered, and I I, I don't remember ever finding a reference in Josephus, I don't believe any foreigners were allowed to work on, on the Herodian temple either. That would have been an affront. That would have been un, unlawful in the, in the eyes of, of the Jews. So when we see Isaiah 60 in the light of the fact that it says strangers will build up will build up the walls of my house. They're going to build the messianic temple. Then this truly is revolutionary stuff and it's magnificent. William, have you got your microphone figured out yet? Hello? William, I heard a I heard a rustling there. Okay. Hello? Nope, you're still breaking up, William. I I don't I don't know what the problem is, but uh unfortunately we do not have William with us. Hopefully he can get that straightened out before we uh uh before we uh conclude our program. Uh but anyway, uh, let, let's go back up up there. Uh, to, and to something that I mentioned a few moments ago, and that is how revolutionary this is. Just imagine, if you will, what verse 7 tells us. And and again, I recommend, folks, that you get yourself a New King James, a New American Standard, even a New International Version. I don't often recommend that, but uh, but it will convey the idea here that what verse 7 is talking about <clears throat> is that in the Messianic temple, strangers and foreigners would not only be able to come to the temple and have with them their sacrifices, like the Ethiopian eunuch would have been allowed to do, but you see, when the Ethiopian eunuch got to Jerusalem, he would have had to have given his sacrifice to the priest. And the priest would have offered that sacrifice for him vicariously. He, that is to say, he would have made the sacrifice instead of the eunuch. Now, it would have served as the sacrifice of the eunuch, but the eunuch could never go into the court of Israel. He could never approach the altar of burnt offering. So here, when it says, all of the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered together to you, the rams of Nebaioth shall minister you, they shall come up. Now, here's where it gets different in the different translations. They shall ascend my altar. Okay? Are you following this? They 
shall ascend my altar and be acceptable. I mean, <laughs> I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to get on Isaiah 60 and verse 7. And in the New King James Version, it says, They shall ascend with they. Okay, they shall ascend with acceptance on my altar and will glorify the house of my glory. Now, the American Standard Version says, they shall come up with acceptance on my altar. The Amplified, they will go up with acceptance as sacrifices on my altar. Now, uh, they shall come, the uh, uh, Amplified Version, I'm not real sure which one exactly that is. Uh, anyway, but as I look at this, over and over and over, it expresses the fact that these individuals would ascend the altar itself. Now, someone might, might want to say, well, all in the world this is saying is that the flocks of Kedar, the rams of Neboah, <clears throat> would be brought to Jerusalem and there be offered as a sacrifice. No, this is talking about the the rams and the flocks, they would be brought, but it's those from these regions that that would br I'm stuttering here that would actually bring these animals and ascend the altar. That's how uh, that's how many many commentators understand this, and so this this is a declaration of how foreigners would be able to ascend the altar of the Lord. So uh, I hope you'll take the time to look at some of the various translations and to see what is going on here. At the very, very, very least, what is being predicted is that offerings from foreigners, sacrifices by foreigners, would be acceptable. Now, I don't think that's all, the, all that is at work here. I have to be, as I've already expressed, I think it's talking about those who would bring those sacrifices from Kedar and Neboeth. They are the ones who would ascend the altar and would do so acceptably. And as I said, there, there are some commentators who certainly, uh, certainly agree uh, with that assessment. So to go back to the point that I've been making here, uh, for a little bit of redundancy, if you don't mind, just think how revolutionary it is that it was for the ancient writer of Isaiah to express that the time was coming in which sacrifice, at the very least, at the very least, sacrifices from foreign countries would be perfectly acceptable unto God. Now, you see, this wouldn't be so revolutionary if it were talking strictly about the sacrifices. Because we are told by Josephus, and I believe uh, I believe it was Pliny. That's the name that comes to mind. Perhaps I'm wrong on that. Don't Don't hold me to that, folks. But anyway, uh, no, it wasn't Pliny. Uh, oh, my goodness, I just went blank on who it was. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, we are told that in, in the Herodian temple and even in the Solomonic temple that sacrifices were actually offered for all the nations of the world. Now, normally that was represented by 70 sacrifices, because 70 is a multiplication of 7 and the number 10. These are perfect numbers. And that also goes back to the number of nations that was understood from the book of Genesis. But I, I personally believe that the number 70 was a symbolic number to represent all of the nations of the world, even those that they did not personally know of. Again, the symbolism of the number 70 would lend itself to that. It's it, a multiple of perfect numbers. So 
simply saying that sacrifices from foreign countries, from pagans, would be offered at Jerusalem is not all that revolutionary. Because, again, the Jews offered sacrifices for the nations. And animals were brought from everywhere to serve a sacrifice. But Isaiah 60 is going beyond that. It's going beyond that because it's talking about people of the islands waiting for the Lord, serving the Lord, being converted to the Lord. The abundance of the sea shall be converted to you, and the Gentiles shall come to you. And again, that's Hebrew parallelism. The abundance of the sea, the parallel to that is the Gentiles shall come to thee. And, and so when you take into consideration these, in, these internal contextual factors, that the writer is not focused, just, he's not focused on animals. He is focused on the Gentiles being called into Israel's salvation. In a radical, <clears throat> revolutionary, world changing, that is, world changing for Israel, manner. And that is that the Gentiles coming from Kedar and Nebaioth. And these other regions from Sheba and the different regions, they are the ones. Now, they may bring these sacrifices. They may bring these animals to be sure, but they are the ones who are ascending the altar to make acceptable sacrifices. And again, I want to challenge you to think how that would impact an ancient Hebrew writer, if in fact that's what the text is saying. How would it affect the ancient Hebrew reader, not, not just Isaiah the writer, but how would it affect the ancient Hebrew reader or the listener to the reading of the scroll of Isaiah to hear that one day, when the Lord would glorify his house, when the Lord would have his house, and it would be built by strangers. I've got to tell you, folks, as I've read this passage, contemplated this passage through the years, I have just been staggered and incredibly challenged by how revolutionary this chapter really was. It's one of those that when we read it, we, we today are so far removed from, from that Zetzelleben, that life situation, the real world life of the ancient Hebrews, that we fail to grasp how shocking some of these statements were to them in their world. How puzzling some of these statements would have been because they would have looked back in their oral tradition at the building of the Solomonic Temple. Now, they would have known <clears throat> that the king of Tyre sent gold from Ophir. He sent men to cut wood in the forest, but they didn't construct the temple. They would have known that. So here you have men, foreigners, that were contributing the goods for the construction, but it was Israelites who did the construction. And again, in the time of Nehemiah, no foreigner was allowed at all to do the actual construction of the temple of God. And as I've stated, I'm real sure although I cannot document it at this moment, I'm real sure that no foreigner was allowed to, to aid in the actual construction of the temple, that is, the Herodian temple. So think about how revolutionary, think how radical it was when the Lord said, you know what? Those of Midian and Ephah and 
Sheba, they are going to come. <clears throat> and not only are they going to come, they're going to flow together. And they are going to build my house. Oh, not only are they going to build my house, they are going to build, or you know, the temple itself. They are going to build the altar, and they're going to sacrifice on my altar, and they're going to do so pleasingly. I mean, this is absolutely incredible. Now, by the way, <clears throat> I want to go a step further here and to show you how the New Testament writers interpret Isaiah chapter 60, how they radically redefine. Now, we, we can see from Isaiah chapter 60 that things are being radically redefined, right? Strangers are going to build up my walls, right? Uh, you know, the strangers are going to build up my house. Uh, the Gentiles are going to come. They're going to offer sacrifice on my altar. Uh, the sons of the strangers, again, shall build up my walls. The king shall minister to you, et cetera, et cetera. But there's something else going to take place, okay? Now, notice again, verse 11, your gates shall be open continually. They shall not be shut day or night that men may be may bring to you the forces of the Gentiles that their kings may be brought. Now, I've often pondered as I've read this text whether when it says your gates shall be all opened, if it's just to the city or if perhaps, and, and I'm not satisfied with this, mind you, but if perhaps it's also the gates of the temple. And here's the reason I ponder this question. The gates of Jerusalem were closed on the Sabbath. To prevent violation of the Sabbath, that is, people traveling over a day's journey <clears throat> on the Sabbath and thus violating the Sabbath day mandate of not to go outside their habitations, uh, not to go outside their cities. Now, that was generally understood to mean uh, not to go more than an eighth of a mile on the Sabbath. And, and by the way, the Pharisees had all sorts of ways to circumvent that, but we're not going to go into that. But the, the point of fact is the gates of Jerusalem were always closed on the Sabbath. They were open on the feast days to allow the pilgrims to come and to enter in. They were obviously closed during times of warfare. So there's all sorts of imagery. There are all sorts of background thought that one might bring to this statement, your gate shall always be open continual, never closed, never closed. Now, i got to be real honest with you, there is some question in my mind, and, and uh, I have said from time to time, I've got to pin this down chronologically, I could not tell you if you asked me tonight, when in Israel's history did they begin closing the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath? I believe, I have not documented this, but I believe that it was during the Maccabean period. Uh, but again, I I don't have documentation. I certainly don't have that in front of me. But the whole point of, of, the, uh, of the statement, your gates shall be open continually, is one of peace. It is one of security. It is one of welcoming. So, they shall not be shut day or night that men may bring unto you the forces of the Gentiles. Now, again... They're going to bring the Gentiles. The Gentiles are going to enter the city. 
Well, you, do you realize that technically uh, foreigners weren't supposed to be in Jerusalem? Now, look, I, I emphasize here, technically. That did not happen throughout her history. And the, and the Lord said, by the way, in Isaiah chapter 52, 1 and 2, Arise and rise, arise, arise, put, put on your beautiful garments, O Zion. Raise yourself from the dust, for no longer shall a stranger or an uncircumcised enter your gates. Well, you see, that's because historically, uh, foreigners, strangers, the uncircumcised had entered her gates. And it was seen as a source of corruption. It was seen as a source of uncleanness. And so the Lord says, guess what? In the new creation, it's kind of that safe statement, nothing unclean shall enter you. And by the way, you can link that with Colossians 2, 11 and 12. So anyway, uh, boy, look what time it is. <laughs> so, Verse 14. Now watch this, folks. This is incredible. And this is how the New Testament interprets Isaiah chapter 40. I'm sorry. I still have Isaiah 40 on my brain. Isaiah chapter 60. The sons also of those that afflicted you. Now look, if you look at this from a purely literalistic perspective, from the historical perspective of Isaiah, then you've got to be talking about, first of all, the Assyrians, and then you've got to talk about the, the Babylonians, those who afflicted them, those who took them off into Assyrian and then, and then Babylonian captivity. And, and let's face it, folks, when the Babylonians destroyed the, uh, the Assyrians, then everyone who was in the Assyrian captivity were now de facto de jour in Babylonian captivity. But it still refers to those, all of those who have afflicted you. Okay? Now watch. So here is national physical Israel. They were afflicted by the Assyrians. They were afflicted by the Babylonians. If you read this text within that context, strictly, solely, and exclusively, and literally, listen to what the Lord continues to say. The sons of those that afflicted thee shall come bending unto thee, all they that despise thee, shall bow themselves down at the soles of your feet. They shall call thee the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. Whereof you have been forsaken and hated, so that no man went through thee, I will make you an eternal excellency, a joy of many generations. Now then, i got to hurry. Got to hurry. In Revelation 3, the Lord is speaking to the church. The church, made up of Jews and Gentiles, being persecuted for the name of Christ. And he said, I know your faith. I know your persistence. I know your love. And he says, how you dwell where the synagogue of Satan is, where those who say they are Jews but are not, but they are liars. Now watch this. I will make them to come and to bow down before you and to know that I have loved you. Folks, Jesus himself lifts Isaiah chapter 60, verse 14, directly into the book of Revelation and the promise of the destruction of the persecutors, which would have been understood in its absolutely woodenly literalistic manner by the Jews to apply to the pagan nations being destroyed for persecuting and enslaving Israel. But now, now, Jesus takes it from there, and he identifies the, his church as the true Israel, the afflicted Israel, the persecuted Israel, the Israel about to be vindicated when he says, those who say they are Jews, but they are not. 
They are the synagogue of Satan. I will make them to come and to bow down before you and to know that I have loved you. You see, Jesus is here redefining Israel. That means, that means he's redefining the temple. That means he's redefining the sacrifice. This is incredible stuff. Well, uh, folks, I'm sorry that it was one guy and the Bible tonight. Hopefully, William can get his uh, microphone uh, and audio troubles figured out uh, for next week. In the meantime, thank you so much for joining us here on Two Guys and a Bible on Fulfilled Radio, a voice you can trust. William, hope you get that figured out. Check your emails. I sent you an email earlier, a forward, so be sure to check that. And, folks, once again, thanks again for joining us. And with that, I will say good night and God bless. Thank you for joining the Two Guys in a Bible radio broadcast. On behalf of Dunn Preston and myself, we'd like to say have a very pleasant day and may God bless. Until next time, we'll see you on Fulfill Radio, a voice you can trust.